But now, the troubled face of Graham Greene in this evening's Kaleidoscope feature. Once a Catholic is presented by Christina Odone and begins with the voice of the author himself. There's a passage in Browning which I've always felt could have acted as an epigraph to all my books. Our interests on the dangerous edge of things. The honest thief, the tender murderer. We watch while these in equilibrium keep the giddy line midway. The Dangerous Edge of Things is curious because Green did certainly get involved in the crossover between politics and religion. He was a strong, strong Catholic. It's all a lie, whatever he said about being an agnostic Catholic or an atheist Catholic. He did come over as being a lifelong Catholic from a very esteemed and old Catholic family, but he was nothing of the kind. And that must have come from travelling. He'd been everywhere. And he said to me in his letter to me somewhere, look, you're my biographer, you tell me when I've made these visits. And it was everywhere on the map. There wasn't a spare place here except the Antarctic. Because this man suffered from his great sense of the void. Rootless, restless, Graham Greene was the writer as exile. The man without allegiances or connections, who seeks with his travels and his writings to find a new world. The anguish of the outcast, of the loner and the tormented, fills Green's books. And it's this anguish that continues to excite our imagination, five years after his death. Bill West is currently writing a new biography of the man. Well, he's one of those authors that people imagine is still with us in some sense, because he lived a long time. His earliest books were written a long time ago. I mean, you can see people reading Brighton Rock, and you think, well, wait a minute, that was written between the wars. I mean, before 1984, you know. But because he lived on for so long, but got into the 20th century classics, there's a sense in which he's survived. I think that he got involved in the world and related to the world in a very complicated way, right into the end of his life, and he's going to survive as a, as, as a very serious person. He's not a Dostoevsky. Hmm? He's not a Tolstoy, though I find Tolstoy somewhat dull. He's not a Conrad. Conrad at his best is quite unique. But no one dealt with his subjects. Because life isn't nice. You have to see things as they are. And he was looking always at himself and thought, I'm a shit. I'm appalling. And so he, this is the character that keeps on dealing with these enormous problems of life and death. No one else dealt with them. Certainly not after all after the pessimism of Nietzsche and, uh, and, and Camus and the existentialists, you're getting so far away from the possibility of discussing anything serious in terms of our life and our death. Norman Sherry is Green's authorised biographer. He's devoted 20 years to understanding and recording Green's life and work. My own first encounter with Graham Green was through his book, The Heart of the Matter. I was 20 and trying to reconcile my Catholic upbringing with my less than pious instincts. Suddenly, here was a novelist who made that conflict the focus of his work. He brought God back into literature, and with him, the notion of sin and salvation. He could touch my generation as he touched a generation before. Author and journalist Richard Ingrams. I only met him, Graham Greene, twice, I think, although we'd correspond. He used to send in, he was a great reader of Private Eye, and he used to send in things to Stuart's Corner quite regularly. My impression of him was of a man who was extremely humble, watery eyes, and a very, a very nice expression. I think I will always link him to the film of The Third Man. And uh, I've never forgotten the uh, atmosphere of that film. And I was associating Green with the two characters in it, Harry Lyme, Sort of lurking in the doorway at Orson Welles and um, Holly Martin, the, the main character too, who was a thriller writer, wasn't he? And there's the music and the whole atmosphere of that film uh, had a tremendous impact on me and, and I think all my generation because it was quite different from most of the sort of films that came out at that time that we were used to. Nobody thinks in terms of human beings. Governments don't. Why should we? They talk about the people and the proletariat. I talk about the suckers and the mugs. It's the same thing. They have their five-year plans. <laughs> so have I. You used to believe in God. Well, I still don't believe in God only. 
I believe in God and mercy and all that, but the dead are happier dead. They don't miss much here, poor devils. What do you believe in? Green seemed a very romantic figure against that background and always, and always did, just simply by, he may have done it deliberately because he lived abroad. He wasn't there, he wasn't around. That gave him a cachet which other writers didn't have. Intensely private, enigmatic, a real life version of his own third man, Green lived for many years in self-imposed exile in Antibes. Throughout, he continued writing, 365 days a year. He was very disciplined. He got up 6.30 and then he wrote from 7 to 9 for two hours. That was his routine. He wrote two hours every day. And he wrote with a pen on full scrap sheets of paper, which at one stage were lined and at one stage were unlined. And I forget when in his life he twinge from one to the other. And he wrote in this tiny, very illegible hand. And then I've not never been an early writer, and I would get up about sort of nine o'clock and as I sort of tottered along the end of the shower he would put his pen into his pocket and with a sort of very self-satisfied smirk so he just finished my work for the day you know. Michael Mayer was Green's traveling companion friend and confidant for many years. He was enormous fun to read some people you think he was gloomy but then I was also a very good friend of George Orwell indeed I introduced them to each other and they got on very well and I'm sure if I'd been a Roman Catholic priest, I mean, I'm sure he'd have been very somber and everything, but we never talked about, hardly ever talked about religion, so very irreverently now and then when he said, I wouldn't advise anyone to be a Catholic unless they have to be. And uh, he meant that as a joke, or you meant that seriously? Oh, I think he meant it. And he said, when you were young, when you were a schoolboy, did you go through a deeply religious phase? I said, oh, yeah. He said, he said, did you believe that the flames of hell were waiting beneath the floorboards to swallow you up? And I said, yes. And he said, and did you get out, did you enjoy that? And I said, no. And he said, did you get out of that phase? And I said, yes. And he said, some of us never get out of it. And then he said, I wouldn't recommend anyone to be a Catholic unless they had to be. Childhood, the great source of inspiration for all writers, was crucial for Green. He was born in Berkhamsted in 1904. The fourth of six children, he grew up in Berkhamsted School, where his father was headmaster. This confusion of loyalties, family versus school friends, was to exert a profound influence on in all his work. In his memoirs, A Sort of Life, Green speaks revealingly about this period. His first words were, poor dog. The first thing I remember is sitting in a pram at the top of a hill with a dead dog lying at my feet. My mother once told me how surprised she had been months later by some reference which I made to the poor dog. He was witness to a suicide. One vivid memory was of passing the old almshouses near the Grand Junction Canal. There was a crowd outside one of the little houses and a man broke away and ran into the house. I was told that he was going to cut his throat. Nobody followed him. Everybody stood outside waiting. Adolescence was a mixture of lust, sentimentality and boredom. Why do you so often use in your personal remarks the word escape? What are you escaping from? Boredom. One thing. Well, let's say one of the very clear things. Yes. <laughs> and that even when I was young, even when I was 16, I used to suffer from affliction of boredom. I think this boredom is, is a euphemism for the most deepest of powerful depressions, that he was nearly mad with it. I, I think that's just a way of, of getting rid of the term. The boredom that I've seen in him, I mean, he'd already taken, of course, to Russian roulette at this time which he certainly was doing. There were not blanks, but even if there were blanks, I assure you, if you put a gun to your head with blanks, yeah. you're dead. You're dead within 24 hours. Blanks kill just as much as anything else. This man was very suicidal, and was very suicidal very early on. These intimations of mortality run all the way through Green's work, and we can sense him looking for an anchor, some fixed point amidst this dark landscape. His parents thought he would find it in therapy. 
When he was 16, 17, he lived in the house of a psychoanalyst called Kenneth Richmond. Richmond actually wasn't a psychoanalyst. He was a completely unqualified person who someone had said, hey, why don't you get a stopwatch, which was a, a central feature of the thing in those days, um, and listen to people's dreams, you see. Now, the household was a spiritualist dash... Well, come on, describe it. There, there was Ospensky was hovering in the background. There was all sorts of experimental thought going on. There were there were there were spiritualist readings. There were uh, on the surface they were actually theosophists, I think. Now that is a bit of a maelstrom to have gone through at sixteen or seventeen. So I think it was one of the things I'm writing about that he didn't make a simple passage from the Church of England through to Roman Catholic. I think what happened was he 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 went through a sort of maelstrom and then had thought that he was going to go off to China and sort of be a sort of Rudyard Kipling type figure of some kind, or John Buck and more to the point. Um, and then he thought, I'm not going to do this, and he went off and did some serious journalism and got involved with serious religion as well. Green found religion through love. The object of that love was Vivian Darrell Browning, a Catholic convert who worked as a publisher's assistant in Oxford. His courtship of Vivian was recorded in letters that not only throb with passion for a young woman, but with a newly found love of words a romantic in love with romance. I love you more than John Donne, more than the Pennines, more than Pine Woods, more than No No Nanette and Joseph Conrad and Wet Laurels, more than St. Joan and Claude Coburn, more than shrimps, raspberries and cream and song in the dark, more than dusk in Piccadilly from the top of a bus. I love you more than I love this wretched self even. But this poem moving slowly towards Catholicism, this letter, darling, I could worship with you if you had your arms around me. You see, when I see that Catholicism can produce something so fine all through, I know there must be something in it. Nottingham Cathedral. Green describes it as having a certain gloomy power, and it's here that in 1925, while an apprentice at the Nottingham Journal, he dropped a note into a wooden box at the back of the cathedral asking for instruction. I think he was absolutely determined to become a Catholic. There's a wonderful phrase where uh, Vivian writes to him and says, writing as if, as if it were steps on the stairs, oh, G-R-A-H-A-M, oh, Graham, how perfectly marvelous, madly excited. I now have the register of baptisms that's kept at Cathedral House I am searching for the entry of the celebrated writer, Graham Greene. Monsignor David Ford is the administrator of Nottingham Cathedral. Yes, I have it now. Here I have the entry of the conditional baptism, I notice, of Henricus Graham, Henry Graham. He was born on the 2nd of October, 1904 and was conditionally baptized on the 28th of February, 1926. That is the entry in the Book of Baptisms. Graham Greene had, had this idea that uh, writers who believed in God were more interested in human beings than uh, writers who didn't believe in God. I remember he referred to once to Virginia Woolf's character as being paper thin. And he, the reason was, he said, because uh, she was an atheist. So that there is basically that um, feeling uh, about human beings, which is essentially a religious attitude. The night was slower than the last he'd spent in prison, because he was alone. Only the brandy, which he finished about two in the morning, gave him any sleep at all. He felt sick with fear. His stomach ached and his mouth was dry with a drink. He began to talk aloud to himself because he couldn't stand the silence any more. It's all very well for saints. And then he began to cry, beating his head gently against the wall. Those lines are from The Power and the Glory, the story of an old too fallible priest who's hunted by the atheist regime in post-war Mexico. The book functions both as a thriller and as a moving record of one man's spiritual struggle. Father Alexander Lucy Smith sees despair and hope constantly vying with each other for green soul. In some of his books, he seems to be quite optimistic. 
and in others he is deadly, deadly pessimistic. Now, in the 1920s, when Green was converted, it was a time of enormous pessimism. The time when Eliot, T.S. Eliot, wrote, redeem the time. In other words, when to be a Christian was, so to speak, to nurture this tiny hope, to keep alive this tiny flame that would be relit in a future generation. This is the final scene in the book. A stranger stood in the street, a tall, pale, thin man with a rather sour mouth who carried a small suitcase. He named the boy's mother and asked if this were the Signora's house. Yes, the boy said, but she was asleep. He began to shut the door, but a pointed shoe got in the way. If you would let me come in, the man said with an odd frightened smile. And suddenly lowering his voice, he said to the boy, I am a priest. You, the boy exclaimed. Yes, he said gently. My name is Father, but the boy had already swung the door open and put his lips to his hand before the other could give himself a name. Now that is the most moving thing of the book. Any Catholic who reads this for the first time will weep tears of joy. And I think even if it's just that, you could say that Green is a great Catholic writer on just the strength of that. What Green could do was to write a sentence that if you actually looked at it was enormously sentimental. But he, he constructed it so well. Novelist Beryl Bainbridge, herself a convert. To write at all, yeah. you have to have... Well, I've always felt it, 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 it's, it's a sexual urge. You know? it, it's the energy from a sexual nature, I'm sure of it. And I think the two natures go together. And I think the fact that he wrote the way he did, in such a mixture of passion and religion, if you think of uh, uh, um, another Catholic writer, if you think of Francois Mauriac, who mm. I also like, but you don't get in Mauriac's books this feeling that the heroes or the heroines are being tormented by guilt over sleeping with somebody, whereas with, with Green, you feel that's his whole reason behind everything. You'll never leave her, would you? We're married. If she knew over this, you'd go back like a whip dog. I don't know. You'll never marry me. My dear, I can't. You know that. I'm a Catholic. Oh, it's a wonderful excuse. It doesn't stop you making love to me. It only stops you marrying me. Yes. Go on. Justify yourself. To take too long, one would have to begin with arguments for a god. Oh, what a choice you are. The Heart of the Matter is a story about adultery and Catholic guilt. It's set in West Africa, where Green was working for MI5. Scobie, a colonial policeman, falls in love with Helen, a young refugee. With Scobie, we have the personification of that very Catholic tension between what man is and what he knows he ought to be. For the author and journalist Auburn Wall, this conflict provides immense excitement. Well, it all comes down to the sex thing, basically. I mean, uh, his only apparent struggle in the books is between the, uh, the urges of the heart and, and uh, the loins, if you like, <laughs> and, the, uh, and the urgings of the, of the uh, sort of Catholic doctrine in the head. But I did see that really as a tremendously genuine um, struggle, because I think most people get over that, and they, they, they do their thing, and then they, then they get back to Catholicism. I mean, it's such a very, very small part of Catholicism, it's, it's teaching on sexual matters. And yet it is, it features so largely in those books. It does, doesn't it? Um, but I'm not sure, you see. I think, they, I think they were jolly separate. I think he was, I'm not saying he was being dishonest, but I think he was playing around a bit, pretending there was this great struggle. Because the truth is, we all know what sex is about. You just do it and get on it, and you, know, and, and you know what the heart's about, and you follow that. And I don't think it was such a struggle as he pretends. He just wanted to preach both things, you know, <laughs> you know follow your heart, and, and also uh, try and cultivate the love of God and understand the love of God, that sort of thing. I don't think it was really quite such a struggle as his books may pretend. To me, the reason I, in a sense, that I felt I became a Catholic was to save me from committing sins of the flesh. And the way he, the way he wrote about that kind of, um, you know, the, the, what he felt about. I mean, there's all sorts of things in the heart of the matter, for instance. He says, um, we can love with our minds, but can we love only with our minds? Love extends itself all the time, so that we can even love with our senseless nails. We love even with our clothes, so that a sleeve can feel a sleeve. That, um, that when you do love somebody, in that sense, um, a whole lot of you's taken up, and I think Green knew, knew that much better than any other writer. I mean, he was full of it. Father, will you hear my confession? Very well, then. 
The Dominus sit in 42 head, love is to his rector, and there is a confetti aris omnia peccata to in omni partis et vidis, but it's sancti amen. Since my last confession three months ago, I have committed adultery many times. He'd ask for forgiveness, and he'd light his candles, and he'd, he'd have terrible guilt thought of, and that would be very enjoyable. And he'd probably write half a book on it, and it would be immensely useful. I failed in my duties, and a lot of other things. I can't remember now. Do you think you could avoid seeing her? No. Well, could you avoid seeing her alone? You must promise that. I'm asking you to promise God, not me. It would be no good promising, Father. She needs me. So does your wife. I know. The torment of sex and guilt was one that Green was experiencing in real life. Within a few years of marriage to Vivian, he began the first of several intense affairs. Though he never divorced her, the love affair that became a matter of faith had failed. Yet Green's Catholicism was to remain a constant for the rest of his life, something he could hold on to when all else disappointed. Father Alexander Lucy Smith. I think the thing was, it was safe under Mother Church's wing. It was a church that preached certainty. I mean, a certainty that we can hardly conceive. Rock solid certainty. One of the things that people like Green joined the Catholic Church for was the fact that they saw it as the church of the people rather than the Church of the Middle Classes, the Tory Party of Prayer, that the Catholic Church is there deep down on the ground. It is a grassroots religion, and it's, you know, the people that really matter. I think that perhaps what we've got to see Green as is somebody who's looked into the bottom of existence and seen that it's absolutely horrendous. I think some people can come to faith through tremendous despair. In fact, faith isn't real faith unless you've experienced, to some extent, despair, because it's only through despairing that we value our trust in God and God's trust in us. He was deep, deep in his character, uh, a sort of fierce defense of anybody who everybody else was ganging up on him. And I think it was a large part of his Catholicism, you know, that he saw it as a church of poor Irish, hopeless people. Not at all as my father saw it, I think, as a, as a, as a church of sort of um, recusant ducal families and things like that. Uh, his was very much a sort of living faith, and the, the fact that he managed to put it around a bit sexually and, and drank and all that made it much more attractive, because one could see that it was the religion one could possibly take on board under those circumstances, <laughs> not under the circumstances of moderation in all things, charity, all that. Uh, it, it was a much more attractive religion as taught by Green. In his closing pages of his novel, The Comedians, Green drew a parallel between the Catholic Church as a living faith and communism. Both have created great crimes, says one of his characters, but at least they haven't stood aside like more established societies, and remained indifferent. Revealingly, he goes on to say, I would rather have blood on my hands than water like Pilate. This rather unorthodox view was in evidence in Green's long-standing friendship with Kim Philby, his former boss at MI5. A writer must change sides at the drop of a hat. He must always be on the side of the victims, and the victims change. Michael Mayer. Reading from Graham Greene's The Virtue of Disloyalty. He liked the outsider. I mean, he was famous, of course, for championing Kim Philby. That was the only thing he and I rarely disagreed violently on, because I said, this man caused the death of hundreds of brave, enlightened men, you know. And then, of course, he loved to trail his coat. I mean, he never forgave the Americans for refusing him an entry visa because he'd been for three months a communist when he was an undergraduate at Oxford. And he, he tended to harbor grudges a little bit. The reason he sort of stuck up for communism and everything was partly because he hated the Americans so much. <laughs> it was a sort of... I think he, I think he was someone who, who confronted all the difficulties of, of the Christian faith that you're supposed to believe which are terribly difficult. I mean, it's all very well for people to say that they have a firm faith and all this something, but if you start thinking about them, they're very, very difficult to believe. And then I always think of his remark, which he made just before he died, when he said that um, he pictured heaven as being a place of 
activity that he would be, people would be praying to him and he would be helping them. That seems to me to show a very profound religious feeling on his part. I'm riddled by doubts. I'm sure of nothing. Not even of the existence of God. But doubt is not treachery. Doubt is human. Oh, I want to believe that it's all true. And that want is the only certain thing I feel. I want others to believe, too. Perhaps some of their belief might rub off on me. Those words came from Monsignor Quixote, Green's last great novel. This is a running dialogue on the nature of faith between a Spanish priest and a communist mayor. The book was dedicated to Father Leopoldo Duran, a Spanish Jesuit who during Green's last years became his spiritual advisor and personal confessor, the Quixote to Green Sancho. Father Duran remembers how Green was fascinated by his unwavering faith. The Jesuit would say, I do not believe in God, I touch him. For Green, these words contained his whole notion of the living faith. Belief uh, gets weaker and weaker as I approach death. Perhaps it's a return to second childhood, is that because uh, as a boy I didn't have no belief at all. And as a young man, yes. my belief, I think, I wouldn't say it uh, comes back, but my wavering belief gets a little firmer in the company of certain people uh, whose goodness seems to me to be almost must have some kind of supernatural origin. In November 1989, exhausted after a trip to Ireland, Green went to stay at his daughter's home in Switzerland. By Christmas, he'd fallen ill with leukemia. It would prove fatal. At this stage, he wrote to Vivian, his wife for 60 years, thanking her for her forgivingness. The man who all his life had struggled to make sense of sin and salvation was seeking his final peace, his confessor at his bedside. He died very softly and gently. I remember Duran telling me I wasn't there at the death, I was there at the funeral. Because he died so quickly and he was still writing me letters. And suddenly, uh, he died, and he just suddenly went into a coma. And yet Duran was there? Yes, Duran was there. So, is that is Duran proof that Catholicism held him even...? Oh, there's a thousand and one reasons why I know he remained a Catholic. God will not leave you alone. He said to me, I remember him saying to me, I hope I'm hounded by God. I can't believe in a heaven which is just passive bliss. If there's such a thing as a heaven, it will contain movement and change. What one was crudely trying with pen and ink, the search one was making for understanding, uh, would be pursued intellectually forever, but in a far more subtle and interesting and painless manner. The voice of Graham Greene. Once a Catholic was presented by Christina Adone, the reader was Morris Denham, and the programme was produced by Will Cantifer for the Unique Broadcasting Company. There's live jazz coming up later tonight.